meeting. We do have a couple of folks who can interact through the Zoom piece of it, but it's also being broadcast live um, through YouTube. So it is, it is, and it's, it'll be recorded. So it'll be there for um, people to review later as needed. Um, so again, I'm Tim Tom here, interim assistant city manager, and um, we uh, wanted to cover just a few things today. One is we uh, reiterate what the direction we received from Mayor and Council was on May 4th. So that was the outcome of the community conversation on May 4th. Mayor and Council took action and said, here's the direction. So I'll go through that briefly. And then that also led to some investigations done um, to some of the areas that are being contemplated. So um, it definitely includes a review of G minor, that footprint. Um, and just from a timing standpoint, just as a reminder, we had, you know, the community conversation had eight different concepts and G minor came, uh, was sort of a hybrid and or newer idea that wasn't in the original eight concepts, but it certainly was a, uh, a, a viable option. When that came out, it had uh, it came out right before the council meeting, so it hadn't gone through the same level of, of review as the other options, and and to some degree the public input piece of it. Having said that, it fits within the geography and the ideals as expressed by Mary Council's motion. So, excuse me, Tim. I have a favor to ask. Could we do just a sure. intro, a brief intro? Of we can do that. Who we are and who we represent. We in addition to ourselves. Certainly we can do that. So what we can pause and do that. Um, let's start with Michael and then we can go around the room and then we'll catch this, those on the line. Okay, I'm Mike Ancomas and I'm a member of the core stakeholder group representing San Gabriel Park. I'm Bob Van an architect and I live actually in Post Corner. My two sons live at the Randolph uh, condos over there across from the golf course. I'm a native Tucson, so deep roots. My name is Mark Crum. I was invited by Council Member Kasach at Ward 6, and I represent myself. Bill Dubach, Gloria Solana, all the local family in the Tucson area, back to the Presidio. Michael McCrory, I'm here on behalf of uh, the San Clemente Neighborhood Association, just the other side of Alton. Neil Echo, Reef Park Zoo Board. Uh, Nancy Quigley with Reef Park Zoological Society. Also, uh, core state, state uh, Larry Hamway, uh, City of Tucson Parks and Rec Director. Margaret Drugay, Peter Hall Neighborhood Association. Oh. Gabby Tadeo, Certified Arborist. Fortified Park Center. Uh, Meredith Anderson, Rodmore Broadway Village Neighborhood. Sue Tygelski, Director of Zoom Operations for Reef Park Zoo. Craig Jackson, the Tucson Parks and Recreation Department, Deputy Director of Capital Planning. Vice President of the Tucson Neighborhood Association. Renown Getsy, what chair of State Park? I'm Tom here with the city. Uh, I'm Mark Mayer, <clears throat> I'm here representing the Dewey King Neighborhood Association and, and also one of the uh, two co authors of the GMI plan. Molly McCaskill is going to be running about 10 minutes. I was just going to say, I just realized there is one person missing. Okay. Lane, are you able to, or can we have Star and Margo? Yeah, thank you. Margo and Star, would you like to go next? Okay. I'm Margo uh, Garcia. I'm a resident of El Encanto. And thank you for letting me participate from afar. Hi, I'm Star Sanders. I'm representing the El Montevideo Neighborhood Association. I'm here in Tucson, but my granddaughter is also here. And uh, so uh, I did not come to the meeting. I'm sorry I'm not there in person. But I'm glad I'm here. Thank you. Glad, glad you're able to join us. And thanks for having us do that. We, most of the groups met a number of times. So I sort of took that for granted. So, but thank you. Um, so reiterating what the mayor council direction is talking about the investigations done to date within the geography they specified. And then there's um, uh, an opportunity to review G minor and how it comports with um, the mayor and council direction. There's uh, another one that also sort of came out of the core stakeholder group, but it never, it was sort of post core stakeholder group. 
it's kind of a hybrid of what was the original D and the original G and often affectionately called the claw, which didn't get a, a very full hearing during the course takeover here, but it was sort of right at the tail end. And then there's um, uh, another one that um, for reasons we'll explain is kind of G minor flipped on its head. And we'll talk about that one and, and the reasons for G minor flipped, but let's just take it one step at a time and we'll, uh, we'll kind of go through that. So up on the screen, I'll just wander around a little bit. This is the direction that we have from Mayor Council. They've made this decision. First of all, suspend the zoo expansion. Oh, well, I'll wait for a second. Yep. Hello and welcome. And uh, we had just finished introductions, so if you wouldn't mind, go ahead. I think I'll My name is Molly Kassin, and I am here um, not as a core stakeholder. Well, I'm here instead of Lauren, who was a core stakeholder, but I was active all the way along in the process. Active in the group um, sessions and care deeply about this program. And uh, I'm Tim Tom, your interim assistant city manager, and I'll be your host MC for the meeting. So, one action taken by council was to continue the suspension and redesign, do a new design that has the effect of saving Barnum Hill in the South Duck Pond. So that, that we have absolute clarity on that. Where the zoo expansion will go will not impact Barnum Hill in the South Duck Pond. Number two is proceed with the zoo expansion in the area north and west of Edith Fall Adaptive Recreation Center and it added some criteria. So just for a moment, apologize to you joining online. Edith Fall Adaptive Rec Center, north and west. So we had a number of, we had eight different concepts and they went all the way around the zoo, uh, current zoo footprint, but we narrowed down to north and west of the ARC. I meant your arms for those viewing. Sorry. Oh, you're doing my arms? <laughs> That's right. That's right. All right. Um, <laughs> minimize the use of open green space, maximize the reuse of hardscape, manage the additional cost of the project. So this is not the total cost, but this is the incremental cost impact by relocating the zoo expansion from its original design to be less than 5.5 million. And then deal with the questions of lighting, fireworks and events at high orbit and the potential effects of the zoo expansion. So um, that is um, something that we'll address today. And we have um, some information to present on, on the animal welfare aspects of being adjacent to High Corbett. And then initiate a comprehensive update to the Reed Park Zoo and Reed Park Zoo Master Plan. So uh, just a quick update on that one. That, may, that one's um, right at the beginning stages for those of you that are anxiously awaiting that. We actually have initiated that in the form of a request for qualifications that actually have been published. So it's actually on the street right now. Greg, can you just give a quick status and overview of that? Sure. So that uh, request for allocation was published on July 2nd, and the deadline to apply is July 27th. We are actually having a pre-submittal meeting next Tuesday on July 13th, where people that are interested in applying for this will have a chance to kind of join us virtually, talk about what we're trying and ask questions as they develop their, their proposals. Do you want me to talk a little bit about kind of the high points yeah, of it? it, just, it so because this is the qualifications, we're really trying to find the best organization that has experience in doing a master plan of this, of this nature. So what we're looking for and what we put in the RFP is, or the RFQ, excuse me, is, you know, what kind of approaches have they used with stakeholder and public input processes? We don't want to limit to what we're used to doing. We're looking for what creativity other groups have used throughout the country. So this is something anybody across the country and locally that wants to apply. So we think that's a real critical element is what is that creativity for the stakeholder and community input perspective. We've asked them to evaluate the current plans for the park as well as any other master plans that might impact, for example, the trails master plan that Pima County has adopted. 
previous plans that have been incorporated to the park, like the walking paths. So they'll evaluate all that as we put a new draft project concept. Excuse me, can I ask a, a question? Sure. You're talking about both plans, RFQ, RFQ is for both plans. Now, this is strictly for the Reed Park plan. So this would not be the Zoo Master plan. So we're really looking at the, the park comprehensive. We will have to take into consideration what the final decision is on where the where the zoo is going to expand. So that will obviously be part of the discussion that this company will take into consideration. Um, some of the key elements we've asked them to look at is how we redevelop hardscape, um, opportunities to expand Reed Park. Not sure what that looks like, but we want them to kind of comprehens comprehensively evaluate that. A strong emphasis on sustainability, observe future use of water, the amount of turf we have, the amount of turf we should have. You know, what makes sense, what type of plant materials we would use in the pallet across the park, looking at green stormwater infrastructure that could be incorporated into it, uh, with a with a good look at citation loss, which pretty much bisects the park. Looking at kind of the heat vulnerability that we're dealing with and how that impact the park and how can we plan for this in the future of the park. And then clearly we have a fair amount of solar already in the park. You know, what's the impact of that long term? And should we consider additional solar and how can that be incorporated into the design? And then really looking at a space assessment. You know, we, we've got some park anchors that probably can't be changed. So what are those park anchors and how that impact the long term redesign of the park? Really looking at nodes for public art. We get a lot of requests for public art in this park. So really think of that long term as where the lot of the places <coughs> we should continue to look at that. Looking at existing parking and how parking maybe should look in the future, as well as traffic patterns within the park, both vehicular, bikes, pedestrian. What does that look like long term and how should we maybe change that? And then a kind of assessment, assess, assessment of the maintenance of the current operations of the park, as well as what do future um, maintenance standards look like? So that's kind of a big picture scope that we ask folks to come back to us and come back with their thoughts on how they might go through a community work. Thanks, Jim. I have a question about the master plan. Uh, you know, it is it, from the beginning. It's been a real, um, I don't know, red herring. I'm not sure what to call it. Why we didn't have a master plan, having been on the city council for eight years, I never really realized that a park this large could go without a master plan. So I'm understanding from the Ward 3 Council Office that this master plan process will overlap, coincide, will be a part of this process of the zoo expansion. So can you let us know? It makes sense to me as a person who's dealt with policy and parks over the years that these two should not be separated, that they should be related. And as I understand it from uh, Karen Ulick's office, there is supposed to be a correlation. There will definitely be a correlation between the Repark Zoo Master Plan and the Repark Master Plan, because when you're planning one, you're planning both. Either way, if you have a zoo footprint that is expanding, you're also needing to take into consideration the impacts and or benefits to the park itself. What we're talking about here is one set of skills that's going to be looking at the big picture all around. One of the inputs to their master planning is going to be the current zoo footprint plus whatever the expansion footprint is. So we are we are we have direction from mayor and council on the zoo expansion footprint, and we're here today to talk through what, what that looks like, and that will establish the zoo expansion footprint. That is the <coughs> input to the repart to repart master plan. Yeah. When we move forward, though, whether one's an appendix to the other or however that looks like, I agree with you. They, in in some ways, got separated, and they need to not be. It's all. It always needs to be the same conversation. Now they got separated because nobody was watching, and um, so I'm, you know, here to tell you, people are watching, and green space preservation of parkland has been at the top of the list here for the community. It is in our community core values, not taking care of zoo animals, but green space. So I, I don't know what's going to unfold here and none of, it, none of us were privy to any kind of uh, agenda or any a chance to look at the plans that you're talking about beforehand. 
but I can tell you that that is a core value for master planning in this park. So, um, I, I mean, that, that came up all the way through the process in the spring that the mayor and council initiated, and it comes up in our plan in, tu in Plan Tucson, and it comes up every single conversation you have in the neighborhood. So, you know, I, I don't know how you could, how you could separate out doing a footprint and then coming in later and talking about a master plan for a park. I, I don't understand it. And, and I thought perhaps from what I heard at Ward 3, that this was going to, they were going to work on each other go, as we went along. They were not going to be separated. Like one group goes over here and makes a plan for a footprint. And then later on, you have to work around that footprint when you do the master plan for Reed Park. So I just want to bring that up because it's been disturbing since last February, Tim, when we first sat with you and the city manager and Steve Kasachek and Richard Quindris. It has been our issue and it has never been addressed. And I'm glad to see that it's being addressed, but it shouldn't be now uh, somehow said, well, we have to do these things separately. I just want to share that input because <clears throat> as somebody who's made policy on parks, I did not know how you can make a decision this large, this impactful on a park and not consider it part of a master plan. Almost impossible. And the community is looking to us, all of us in this room, and especially the mayor and council, to solve this and make it work in a transparent, just, and a future-leaning way. So, understood. So let's let's work through today. That we're there's no there's no rules to today other than let's we're having a conversation about exactly what you described and grounded in the guidance provided by Mayor Council. This is good. I just bring it up because the master plan has been my issue from February. I kept saying, where is it? Well, why can't we see it? And we were told we were going to see it, by the way. And Tim, you were in the meeting and we have the transcript. So I know what was said. Mike Ortega said, we'll get you that. We'll get it for you. And we never got it. And then we found out there really wasn't one. It hadn't been updated for years. It was way out of whack. So anyway. Yeah, that's like where we are. We're at the director, start of that process. Right at this point, the, the, what, what troubles me in particular is that we did not receive any kind of written material in advance of this meeting. For example, the items that Craig was just talking about, well, I have to take notes on that. It's labeled as a meeting and a discussion. But some people in the room are privy to the items you present, and those of us mostly in the neighborhood community side uh, do not have the background material to be able to reflect, discuss with some of our colleagues who are not going to be present as to what our disposition may be towards any of the items that may be discussed today. And uh, American Council has meetings, and they get a general material on Thursday before Tuesday evening. At about nine years on the planning commission, and, and we didn't come to meetings with no agenda material. You know, and for a group like this, that uh, uh, maybe not every detail can be set out, but uh, clearly there has been a uh, review that has been done uh, and already. We're hearing about the RFQ, and, and this could have been put in writing and presented to us so that we had that background coming into this meeting. I second that. I also would like to understand why we we're all, you know, several of us took a two hour tour and it's very intense on asphalt and looked at all of the storage yard and looked at the space and looked at the issues. And we all spoke about it afterwards and spent extra time talking about the bridge, the bog, and his associates coming abroad, uh, looking and problem solving and trying to figure it out. And we were never asked for our input. We finally gave it. But the radio silence between May 28th and now was extraordinary. Well, the silence is broken. We're here to have a discussion. I have information to present. So let's start working through it. We did uh, G minor, boat unlocked an area. You're gonna be my arms, sorry. <laughs> sorry. So you brought up the maintenance yard. That's an excellent point. So the maintenance yard, which is to the north, 
part of the slide here. Um, I know that there was a group of, of folks that came out and toured it. We also toured it. Um, the main objective, at least from, from my perspective, was if that's an area to be redeveloped, what, what, are, the, what are the pros and cons of it? What, what's achievable? What, what, what is something that can be done uh, with minimal cost or impact? What are things that are much more expensive? So there's, um, the short answer is much of that area can be redeveloped. It's all currently hardscape, asphalt, or buildings. And by buildings, there's things that are just more like shed-like structures, and then there are things that are more concrete or you know, cement buildings that are harder to move. The only things that we sort of took off the table is it's even all the way off the slide. Is there's a Sam warehouse, which is a, a large structure that actually um, has it's underutilized right now by the city, but it would be the future for any storage, logistics, and needs of the parks can move into that building. And then there's a fuel island right next to it and trying to relocate that fuel island really doesn't make a lot of sense. So it's really that area we've sort of said, okay, it doesn't make sense to, to try to relocate or remove that. But to the very north is what we call the barn. It's really just a shade structure, critical function in it, but that critical function can be moved. The three um, like north south looking, those are storage units. They're utilized. Um, are they optimally utilized? Probably not, but they're, they do serve a function and multiple functions, both on the parks and the recreation side. And actually there, I believe there's even some other storage for other functions. Consolidating that and or relocating that, including more optimal use of the SAM warehouse facility makes, makes that space reclaimable. There's also, um, a, don't let me leave this slide without talking about Lakeshore Lane. There's Lakeshore Lane itself. There's parking lots along Lakeshore Lane. All of that's reclaimable, but we have to deal with park circulation and, and, and people's ability to move and utilize the park. But we've got lots of ideas around that, both from G minor, but also from, from other options. On the Southern end of the parks maintenance compound, it gets a little more dicey. That The, the building there is a, is a true building and it's our welding shop. It doesn't mean it's a total non-starter. It's just, it gets more expensive when you start to deal with where that operation could be relocated. Um, but it's, um, if we can leave it in place, great. If it's the only thing standing between us and a solution, we'll figure that out. What it means though, is there's a electrical, big electrical service. There's a big, gas service, there's a big water service all through that area. So that kind of Southern edge is, is just difficult to work with depending on what you're doing there. The, the East West is actually kind of an easement that has a lot of that utility in it. So the, again, the short answer is a heck of a lot of that area can be reclaimed and, and repurposed. It's, and, and, it, and it even, depending on what we do with it, 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 it doesn't blow the budget. So. That and I know that that's a big, a big opportunity of reclaiming hardscape, one way or the other. Um, with regard to, to Lakeshore Lane, what I heard pretty loud and clear, but I am looking for people to push back on this if it's not, if it's not truly the thoughts of the, the neighbors, especially, is that the, the the road itself and having vehicle traffic on that road is not necessarily a high value thing. Having cars moving up and down Lakeshore Lane, bisecting this park, I've been hearing that's actually more of a troublesome thing, both from a speeding standpoint and a safety standpoint, that actually having vehicle traffic through there is, is not preferred. Yeah, I'm hearing the exact opposite from my people. Okay. They want Lakeshore Lane undisturbed. Okay. I don't, I'm, I'm in that area all the time. I don't see so many people speeding there. There are plenty of speed bumps. And it's, it's a very easy way to get through. If any accidents happen on 22nd, you know, and you want to come around this way and get into the South Duck Pond area, you can turn around and come the other direction. So you're hearing people <coughs> from Lane. I was under that impression too, that preserving the traffic flow on Lake Shore Lane was important. On the natural boundary? If there's a natural mm -hmm. boundary. Okay, so for vehicle traffic, <clears throat> what, we, what we were, uh, contemplating is keeping it as a 
both a maintenance road, but also an emergency vehicle access, but we would, we were looking at repurposing half of it to be more of a bike pedestrian ADA accessible trail for park users as opposed to a road. The only concern with that is that when you have baseball league playing, when you have your high school all those, they fill up that parking area. So I, I, just, I just, we don't seem to want to ever address parking and traffic circulation. So I'm glad this is brought up. I've been dealing with this for four decades, three decades as president of the neighborhood. So I, I mean, this is a major discussion and I think it really goes to the master plan. It's hard to make a decision today on this without really having input, but uh, you really have to look at park usage and not just a discussion at a table. Sit down with the calendar and see how you use it, when you use it. Uh, I think I sent you all some photos as yes. to what occurred and even calling the police because there was no way for emergency traffic or vehicle to get through our neighborhood. They said, basically, TS, it's an organized sanctioned city function. So, you know, it's, it's really difficult to just do that right now. So, so well, that's fair, because that's very, I will admit, this is very different from what I heard throughout the process. Very different from what I heard. Okay. So yeah, I guess I'm kind of, I, I, of a similar mind would say, what's the impact of that decision being a part of the master plan? It does feel like that's a substantial sort of question for the park, right? Sort of flow in the park. So, so if that is not part of your plan currently, um, is is that an issue for your design I mean, concept of what you're working for? It could be revisited within the context. Of the plan. That's a question. So we have we have thoughts on it based on what we understood a month ago that will ask it to address. We were focused, I will tell you, on park user traffic flow and connectivity, as opposed to vehicle connectivity based on everything we heard leading up to recently. And then uh, parking, we've heard loud and clear. No, I, I just want to make right. one comment besides that. Do not treat this as a park. It's a regional park, which means traffic comes from all over the city, and it's not isolated to a certain section of a city like Himmel Park or something else. And we've all learned our lesson with High Corbett Field, because when they went out to the Rockies, the Toros went out, I'm sorry, the Toros went out to, uh, what's that field like there? <laughs> Keno, they flopped. So they came back to High Corbett. So, I mean, there's a difference in, I don't see any parking reduction. We have to increase the parking because it is the major regional park in the city of Tucson. A clarification regarding the G minor concept, which we know is only a concept, not really a design, was to preserve that um, infrastructure, that parking, that solar array. It's one of the things that we actually uh, touted in our concept was that we were able to preserve all that, which is heavily used. I've been there on many different occasions, and that parking lot is full of people are using that field to fly kites and run their dogs. And um, Tucson is a vehicular city. That we, uh, well, for, you know, for good or for ill, it's a reality. People come to the park in their cars. And so oftentimes visitor flow, park goer flow is equal to vehicle flow because people come and go with their cars. And as uh, it's been pointed out, you know, the baseball season, that's an important access point. So the, all part of the big picture, which again is part of the master plan. Oh, well, also to clarify in the G minor concept, we were not affected, we were not proposing to replace or take down any of the buildings on Randolph Way. The warehouse was outside our boundary, as was the welding shop. So we had assiduously avoided those things and looked only at those metal sheds that we thought might be able to be relocated. Another concept that was offered actually by Margo Garcia, the planner who's joining us uh, remotely, is that she's been doing some planning with the Los Reales landfill where they have a big vehicle maintenance shop and vehicle storage area. Who, and she was informed, Margo, and you can correct me if I got the wrong impression, but it sounded like Los Reales was you know, willing to welcome vehicles from the park and sort of consolidate vehicle maintenance, which may have some efficiencies long-term for the city and your budget and how you, instead of having two separate installations consolidated, and it's just you know, a few miles to the south, but we have Albert on running up and down, we have the freeway. Just again, thinking maybe on a little wider scale of if we're able to move some of these you know, incompatible functions out of the heart of the park. Again, with the overarching goal of 
preserving as much green space as possible, which was part of the mayor and council's decision A, numero uno, letter A, minimize the use of green space. Mm -hmm. All that's understood. We're about to look at okay. the minor here in a second and talk through it. Okay. Just a quick footnote on this that relates back to the master plan for Reed Park is that years ago it was discussed creating a, a shuttle from uh, huge parking lots over Elkhorn, uh, creating a little bus shuttle for special events, meaning high carpet games, big, large, you know, whatever. Uh, you know what I mean. That's master plan work that, right. and, and it relates directly to this expansion because handling the traffic, parking, all of that is a part of this expansion issue and was right from the beginning. And what Bill is saying, four decades of it. So now we're gonna to try to do a piecemeal and that, that doesn't really make sense. So as I'm saying, this is another master plan park, master plan issue that should tie in to everything and not be just about the zoo's master plan. So I wanted to add a, a few things on the parking and the G minor plan. Um, can, can we hold a little bit more G minor until we get to the slide that shows sure. G minor? Sure. Just I, because we're talking about right. G minor a lot, sure. we've got more background to give before we go selling or debating G minor. Sure. Let's see. Just it. telling you, there's there's some information you need to have. Let's move on to be able to do that. Let's just one more point. I just need to get one more point about make sure you um, I did a few things about cars, but I just want to make sure that for this plan and everybody, you build for what you want to see. So if you want to see something that's car centric, build for it. If you want to see something that makes space for pedestrians and bikes as a priority, you go for it. And that is all. Thank you for that. That's a good perspective um, that we can include as well. So, I talked about Lake Shalane. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else? Okay. Um, one other background piece. Um, we need to talk about D, which is the proximity to high corporate field. I have zero expertise in this area. So, Dr. Sue, would you like to share what you have studied? Sure. relative to that. Sure. And so some of this information is you may already know, but I want to just go briefly through um, animal welfare concerns. So when we think about animal welfare, um, it's a little bit like when you talk about sports, there's lots of different kinds of sports. And I think people toss around the term animal welfare. It can mean lots of different things. But what I'm talking about in this room is really the professional standards that we're held to for our AZA accreditation. So there are about 2,400 zoos in the US. Of those 2,400, only 241 are accredited. So the accredited zoos have higher standards that we're held to. In 2018, there was actually a welfare standard that was added to the accreditation inspection. and. While welfare has been a high priority throughout AZA history, it is now pulled out as a separate item. And so when we talk about welfare, we're looking at the animals' diets, we're looking at their health, both physical, mental, emotional well-being, we're looking about at their ability to self-maintain, so to groom, to play. We're looking at species-specific behaviors. So if you're a bear that's supposed to climb, do you have the opportunity to climb? And then also choice and control. So where we can give animals the ability to choose to have impacts on their own environment. So when we look at those and um, consider what our options are for expansion, we have to take into account how the external environment would impact the animals. For the animals that we're considering, tigers, red pandas, slimakes, lock bear, there are animal care manuals that AZA's use have cooperatively written. And in those manuals, they talk about different, um, the ideal habitat that you would build, things that you should consider. Um, basically the household hints for how do you breed tigers? So if you're gonna get tigers together, what's the best, the best way to do that? Because it's it can be a little bit um, of a challenge. Not all tigers immediately fall in love. 
So when we look at um, those animal care manuals, there's one common thread through them, and it's loud and unpredictable noise it is an extreme stressor. Could it impact the female's ability to reproduce, could impact the ability to put animals together, so for the males and females to meet, um, could impact the ability for the mom to rear her youngsters. And of course, a question that comes to mind is, well, how are high orbit field noises different from 22nd Street? Our elephant herd lives right on top of 22nd Street. 22nd Street has very predictable sounds. So through the day, there's rush hour, and then perhaps a little quieting, and then more rush hour, and then through the night, it's most often relatively quiet. But it becomes a um, predictable pattern. The high corbett noises, the PA system, the crowd noises, the potential fireworks are very different because the decibels are through the roof and the unpredictability of whether it's going to be a boring game and there's not going to be as much noise or whether it's an exciting game. So for an animal living close to that kind of noise, it really can elevate their stress level. So from a zoo animal welfare and husbandry standards, um, being right adjacent to high corbett field is just not an option to provide optimal welfare. Anything else you know? Um, in your assessment, do you have literature, scientific stuff that supports this? Right. So both from our AZA accredited zoo partners, so the AZA um, Animal Welfare Committee, which is a group of prof professionals across the country, from those uh, manuals, as well as just scientific literature. I mean, if you go and, and just Google, um, tigers and cats and their hearing and the sensitivity they have to loud noises. Um, also, you know, we looked at sound mitigation. There are zoos that this is such a new field. So 10, 20 years ago, people weren't paying so much close attention to this. And that's why there are zoos that are currently close to or in downtown. Go to Chicago and Park Zoo is right in the heart of the city. But now that we have these standards, we can't ignore them. And so the literature is, it's an exciting time. Um, in this process, while a challenge for everyone here at this table, we're at an exciting time where we're learning so much about wild animals and sound impacts and light impacts. So um, not being with the natural circadian light cycle. Uh, like with such a high standard for noise sensitivity, Owner's Reed Park is really even a appropriate place for the zoo at all anymore. So we currently monitor our collection and so at the, where we are relative to high corbett, so when there are games and fireworks, we have staff there uh, monitoring our animals. And I think at that distance, it isn't. And so even the biggest issue would be immediately adjacent to high corbett. The farther you get away, the sound in terms of decibels is less impactful. Because you know, none of us, wild animals, domestic animals or humans will ever live in a perfect bubble. Um, but that amount of noise being right on top of high orbit isn't uh, something we can mitigate for the well, well, what I'm saying is that noise is already a factor for those animals, as it is. Right, and the, but at the distance that we're at, so we are not, our zoo currently is not right um, on top of high orbit. So right. we're talking about the flight path. <clears throat> oh, I live, I live up, um, on the corner of East Lone Street. Uh, the flight path goes directly over my house, not as low as it goes <clears throat> as close to the animals. Where they were trying to bring that, it would have been even further under the flight path. Anytime that they have issues with a breakdown at, at, at uh, Tucson International Airport, and they, they end up going, I, they were going over my house every 90 seconds. Right. And, and, you know, and then also, if you're talking about the park, on Saturdays, you can have a jumping castle and bounce every single lot of DJs. It's quite loud. I can hear it across country club all the way down to my home, right. you know, so that's also an issue. And I think that's what Mike is speaking to as well. So just we, in general, yeah, no, the noise just, in general right. is already a problem. And we do, we do measure that and monitor for that. And there are, there have been times where we have had loud DJs where we have changed what we're currently doing with the animals. Um, but I think the difference with a baseball field, um, the PA system and the fireworks are just at the, the level that's even beyond the planes. Okay, I'd like to jump in on that one, certainly. I think there'd be a very high level of support from the surrounding 
neighborhoods to lose the fireworks. Yes, I know. We have enough of the fireworks. I right. used to be in this country, in this community, fireworks were for a special occasion. Now it seems like every marketer, promoter, whatever feels like they have that fireworks for everything. I think we just lose the fireworks regarding just the mm -hmm. normal crowd noise from the baseball game. Uh, how many we're talking about the University of Arizona baseball team? How many games a year do they have? What is that? The percentage of the 24 7, 365 days a year, maybe one quarter, one percent of the time. But the noise and, in and of itself, that, that event, those few events are enough to cause potential tragedy at the zoo. So it really is um, not within. Well, I don't limit. buy that versus 22nd Street because you have normal traffic and then you have uh, uh, motorcycles that are just roaring down the, the street. Uh, the decibel level is very different. Though. That, that's the difference. So how they're hearing is, is different. So uh, we do know, I mean, the first time a motorcycle rally went by, our herd reacted differently. The first time an animal was new to our zoo and we have fireworks, we are at the zoo monitoring them to see if they need something different. Do they need to be pulled in indoors where it's a little bit more buffered? So that's a constant thing that we are um, managing. But being adjacent to high corbett, that, that's my concern that that's something we cannot manage for our animals. The air traffic is certainly, if we could stop all fireworks and air traffic, um, would that be better animal welfare? Yes, but that is probably beyond the scope of this meeting. Um, and so what I'm focused on right now was proximity to what we do. So, the fireworks issue, Nancy knows me well on this. <laughs> I've been fighting that issue for days, for years, for decades. Because it, it's a problem to be at this location with the zoo here. As to the jet noise, there's a 1975 ordinance that is not enforced that the jets are not supposed to fly with the zoo. The problem is with our snowbird operation, and we can't control that. But there is a 1975 ordinance, and I have sent that information to the league. But as far as the city, the city can just stay right now, no more fireworks. I was told under the contract with the university when we were negotiating this whole thing, I was at the table, that there would be no fireworks and they were not to serve liquor past the fifth inning. Walked out of there and everything changed. So this is one of the issues is that as neighborhoods, we come to the table, we donate our time, we give our input with facts, we walk out and it's like, bye. And that is the real issue here. Again, I have four decades and three decades being a president, and you know me quite well. <laughs> I, I was the Friday call every Friday to Carolyn Campbell talking about the issues, and I've worked with Mark to tone down the concerts. The city had to spend $35,000 to bring in Mark Marcelli to do a study to prove us wrong, and it turned out we were right. That the noise from the band shell intensifies because of the heat plume and those that are sitting in the front row of the band shell the people on 29th have the same decibel level and that was what was upsetting is that the city did not believe us and they spent thirty five thousand dollars and this has been 20 years more than that right mark that we had to go that far so here we are as people that have been in these areas for years and years and years and our input is dismissed. I'm going way off such. I am so sorry. But, but I am upset with this information because I even called the head of the veterinarian school and said, there's an issue with fireworks. And they said, absolutely not. That is not what I'm hearing today. Nor do I see it in all the animals around our neighborhood that our mm -hmm. residents put on sedatives or if I call the pound. So this is a real issue that we have to be factual and truthful. And I don't care if the university loses a couple of thousand because they had a lower attendance because there wasn't fireworks. I really don't care. But it is for the health and welfare of the residents, those that are veterans who are exposed to this type of noise, to all animals, including our pets, and to the zoo. We have taken that into consideration in my neighborhood for years and years and years. 
So, and it's, it's really blown up now to, to a point where the community, the city is aware of it. And I'm not the weird guy out there saying BS, I'm sorry. Right. But that's the way we can treat it. Regarding the fireworks, which is one element, I hear you and Lara knows what I want to do. And I only want cause. I, I, I understand. But that. I absolutely hear you on the fireworks. And it's on my list of things to do something about because I, I agree with everything you said about fireworks. No doubt. And I may not be in my role much longer. <laughs> but, but she knows and we've no. been talking about it. This is something I want to do something about. The ASAP. I'm with you. I think there's a lot of support for that. <laughs> Having said that, um, and so my first question when we first learned of the, the concerns over animal welfare, I'm like, let's get rid of the fireworks. But that's not the only element. So I just want to make sure we, we I hear you. I'm going after fireworks. Let me that <laughs> but why did it take me 30 years? <laughs> I don't know. I wouldn't want to prove <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and we're going to but then gate. If you had your hand up. I, just I had a quick question, uh, Doctor. Uh, so moving north of East Ball, um, you would lose your accreditation as a zoo, if, or you just can't place tigers there, or you, can you put a different animal? That's a great question. That's a great question. So we looked at if um, that was the expansion area, what other um, animals, you know, would there, would there be options? And uh, based on the information in the animal care manual, we would have a very difficult time acquiring animals because zoos, there's a body that looks at placing different animals and what they look at is not only in the zoo, but they look at the facility, so the habitat where it's located, they look at your veteran program, they look at your animal care staff, um, they look at your financials. And so all those pieces go into <clears throat> deciding which zoo should have this animal and will they be capable of three day run? Will they, um, or are they better suited to house elderly animals? Um, or so, this I think that if we had that area, and this is just my best guess, I don't think we would be able to find we would have zoos, partner zoos willing to cooperate with us. Did you separate the potential crowd noise from fireworks? Separate out fireworks from, yeah, yeah I think it's still. And it's, it's um, again, this is a young science, but um, from my standpoint, if we have a lot of question about what happens when tigers get uh, frightened when they aren't being introduced well and they have an event like that, I mean, it's death. It's not, it's not something that we can get in the middle of. Or, so when we build our tiger facility or our red panda facility, we have to be really thoughtful. Because it's it's not only the breeding future for these endangered species, but it's those individuals we're not going to acquire animals that we can't care for and that we are setting up to have these potential threats. And just so I can quit, I want to jump in. You and not too. I just have one. I'll go after you. I just want to say that. Maybe it seems to us what, why we kind of you know get excited uh, about this is that if you bring someone from the zoo, a specialist, to talk about fireworks, then it appears that your hands are tied. I mean that fireworks is actually a key issue. Fireworks only started at High Corbett how many years back? Oh, two so two rooms. It's not it's been seven. that long. I went to games there as a kid. No fireworks. The place was packed. I took my kids there when they were growing up. No fireworks. Place was packed. I mean, come on. I'm sorry. This is not an issue. And and then on second hand, I'm a zoo member for many years, and I love the zoo. And the care of animals is like primo for me. And that's why I voted for Proposition 203 was to improve the current habitats inside the zoo. None of us voted for an expansion of tiger breeding area. Uh, I, I'm, you know, just want to remind us all of that. I'm sure that's not far from people's minds. We didn't vote for that, and I'm not sure we're capable of balancing all these balls in the air. I mean, of animal and human welfare, right? I, I mean, park welfare. I don't know. 
it's uh, and and Tim, I don't want to slow us down anymore, but you can see if if you had given us the agenda before and we knew what was going on exactly before we came, I think it would have been extremely helpful. And that's my <clears throat> perception as a council person, having done a lot of public participation, is that you make people feel more empowered and more part of what's going on. So I feel like we're now going back over some things that we already discussed for the entire spring at different meetings. Uh, I hear what you're saying. Uh, I don't remember animal welfare of being proximal to high corbett being discussed throughout the spring because G minor came the week before the meeting. So I, I can't say that it was a core part of the core state public group discussions. It's a discussion. staff discussion. It's a small amount we discussed it. Right. So I don't this is this is a look at the direction provided by council, which includes potential habitat immediate to high court, which we're doing the due diligence on. Mayor and council did not have an opportunity to do diligence on, on G minor. Well, I would suggest that the fireworks now, because I live on 23rd Street, the fireworks are extremely loud. The ballpark is not, except every once in a great while, maybe someone gets a home run, you can hear the crowd noise. But I would say that this current configuration, the mm -hmm. zoo is more affected by fireworks mm -hmm. than the G minor configuration with no fireworks and just crowd noise. So I don't have the expertise to draw that conclusion. What I do is tell you I'm gonna go after the fireworks. Right. Regardless of where we been, what we do, yeah, and about fireworks, right, and throughout the city. <laughs> I, I can't say that. that. I, can't, I can't say that because all of a sudden the university had it, and it's been it impacts over here at, at the track field. Yeah. Where the hell did that come I, from? I emailed the university, and I more or less said, "Talk to the fall." Right. So, and then we started, yeah, and then all of a sudden they started having them for the concerts. Yeah. So it's, yeah, I got that. But, 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 <laughs> but to just move it, I'm, you know, because the track field is right here. So, all of a sudden, have fireworks there, it's just not acceptable either. Can I ask a quick question? What accreditation, what are you talking about for the Association of Zoos and Aquariums? And their website is aza.org. So I'm just I I've committed to two hours today and I I would I so I appreciated learning something new. I, I would really love just to allow to move through the content so we have a basis for conversation. I feel like we're going off in a lot of directions and we just have an hour left. Could I I may be unpopular in that, but I would really love to hear what what you want to share with us today. All right. There's only three slides total, so <laughs> that's a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff on there. So uh, let's go to the next slide, which is the start of. Uh, it'll be. Thanks, guys. Okay, it's half a slide because they're stuck on the other half. But so G minor, and I know work continues on G minor. This is just the image that I was able to get my hands on fairly quickly. Um. Redeveloping the park maintenance compound and connecting it to the main zoo is a concept that came forward as G minor. Um, we've talked about how much of that area, I mean, whether or not we have to change the outline or what we do, I'm not as worried about that. It's the general concept works. That area can be redeveloped. I will say we do have some concerns over maintenance connection and emergency animal um, needs getting to the medical center and back. Um, but it's it's not insurmountable. And what I'll say is all along, we've looked at how do you make it compatible, regardless of where the zoo expansion goes, you have to have zoo user traffic connection. You have to have zoo maintenance slash animal uh, medical connection inside the zoo envelope. And then you don't want to just blow up or disrupt um, park user traffic. So in this case, park users are on the are on the um, ground at grade. The zoo traffic goes over the top. That can work. How how we configure that does have impacts. And even though, and we'll come back to Lake Shoreland in a moment because I what what Les said made a lot of sense to me because 
are we targeting vehicles? Are we targeting bike pedestrian ADA? I think our council would go toward a more bike pedestrian ADA compatible user group than vehicles. But that's not, that's just me interpreting the direction we've been going. Are you talking about the east and west flow underneath? It's both uh, east and west, but depending on where the zoo footprint goes, you have to deal with north and south as well. I mean, and we, we'll, we have another one to show and then another one to show. Um, so it's all vehicle direct, or all directions for park user traffic. So preserves Barn Hill and Duck Pond, maximizes the reclamation of hardscape, limited impact to green space. I don't, I hate to call anything zero because like there's, there's trees in, in, in parking lots. It's, so it's not zero, but it's very limited. It does preserve the current park experience because, you know, your park, other than parking, which this is parking through here inside the envelope is drawn, but I, I know we can address uh, parking. I know we can address it. Um, and it is doable to go up there. Um, I have a budget concern and I'll say that there's three camps on that. Some say I've been overinflating the budget and some saying I've been overinflating the budget. I feel like I'm doing my best without drawings or any other concept to say, it's roughly in this ballpark. So I don't give it a, I, I don't, I'm not saying I know for sure this would exceed 5.5 all in of net cost, but I'm concerned about it. There is some concern for zoo operation and user experience. And I'll simply express that as the further away the habitat, if I were to go up there and the zoo experience, now you have um, a longer walk, longer for ADA folks, to get from one part of the zoo to the other. It's not a fatal flaw, but it is something that's a factor. But I've given it the does not meet animal welfare needs based on the information I've gotten from the expertise that has that expertise, which I don't. But my understanding, and it's not, because the very first thing I asked is when that issue was brought forward was, let's get rid of the fireworks. Because I, I went straight to where you all went this. I'm not a big fan anyway, and if that's the if that's the fatal flaw, we'll have that conversation. We're still going to have that conversation, but it's not just about the fireworks. So this is the conclusion that I've drawn. But I'm just one person that putting the habitat up there is is not an acceptable outcome based on the mayor and council motion and based on what we know about animal welfare. I'm going to go through the other two or the, the next one, but I, I just want to say, but we're going to get to one where we basically flipped G minor on its head. And I think we get to the same, if not better outcomes. So just walk with me for a while because G minor did inspire. What G minor did is unlock that area because we, we hadn't been able to find a way to get into that area and use it to solve the problem. G minor unlock that. Now we're looking at, okay, how do we balance it all together? So just work, walk with me for a bit. The next one is. Oh, Tim, you oh, were sorry. Gonna, uh, Go ahead. When we did G oh, yes, yes, I'm sorry. Go ahead. The park here. I just so everybody knows, I mean, Bob did this wonderful job of bringing this concept to life, but uh, uh, some of the uh, 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 diagram, uh, uh, it's a little bit off registration. And the G minor uh, to encompass 4.32 uh, acres. Actually, this line would uh, preserve all of this park. So you should shift to the No, I'm, I'm, I'm reflecting back to you on hearing what you're saying. Oh, okay. And uh, so the calculation on the parking would be that uh, it would lose 45 spaces, but could recoup, excuse me, 37 spaces, but could recoup 30 by filling in some of the blanks along here, okay? And of course that doesn't get into the issue of vehicular uh, traffic versus pedestrian and uh, bicycle, but, but in terms of uh, what exists now, this would be done with only losing seven parking spaces. And then also, uh, as Bob mentioned, uh, uh, we did do a work around, around the welding shop, push this line just a hair to the, west, to the east, and, and was able to keep that at 4.32 acres. And if some economizing is done in the uh, 
uh, the uh, uh, zoo plan, uh, particularly in the service areas, then there, there are possibilities to shrink that. So, so that's the parameter to be monitored because I uh, didn't want anyone to have the impression that uh, more parking would be taken than is uh, based on the 4.3 acres calculation. And I have one thank you for, for the that. Talk to ask. So another, uh, Mark and I have discussed this over the last couple of months. You know, we've all been running around busy, meeting deadlines and taking a vacation and all that, but we have been thinking about it. Um, just last week, Mark and I discussed, gosh, functionality wise, wouldn't it be nice to have this sort of east west service access on the north side of the zoo expansion? Um, and you could lie in that outfield wall of high orbit with storage and you know, sort of support spaces for the zoo and have a service aisle that would give access either to that storage and service module or to the zoo in terms of just the flow and the, um, yeah, the you know, connectability of, of, of the zoo. Um, and it would also move habitat somewhat further away from the, uh, from the crowd noise. Although, uh, you know, sound does carry, as you know, uh, and uh, spread out in, as a wave. So um, that would be, I think, further study that we would like to see would be excluding fireworks, taking that off the table, because I think that is the main problem. Uh, let's just see how significant those other issues are in terms of, as Mark pointed out, what percentage of the, uh, of the year do we actually have uh, home games and uh, potential crowd noise if we could wipe out the uh, most egregious uh, fireworks, which I agree. Yeah, I grew up here. There were never fireworks until actually, I think, seventies. Uh, it was in the seventies. Seventy-five. And it was only on the uh, Fourth of July. They didn't have it any other time. And of course, it was a sellout. Everyone was <laughs> seated on the field. But uh, anyway, so the, the again, the the concept, of course, needs a lot of development. And I believe, and early on, and I was corresponding with Nancy, and she was saying, "Yeah, if you can see that there was a potential here, as long as there was some flexibility." So back to you, Tim. Okay. That's the good. question of the playgrounds. Oh. Is, yeah, I mean, is it what we, you know, they say they want to put in the playgrounds in a kind of park or a house with playgrounds, but if they need a playground behind their walls, can they put those kinds of things and buffer that up in those areas as well and then bring the animals over here? Because it does not seem it's very loud over here in Randolph Way. So if, they're, if the tigers are over in this direction, then it would be quite, quite a quiet. They wouldn't be on 22nd. So we did look at what we did is worked with um, the project manager from the zoo to look at what how would you configure this? Let's you know how would you put it? And we did push the more human type elements right up against the fence and the habitat further to the south and west. And we are still at the conclusion that that's too adjacent to high corporate field. I've heard you. That, and, and we did eliminate fireworks from that. Fireworks was not the, the deciding factor on animal welfare. It was the other non-fireworks because I'm willing to take on fireworks. Period. Can, can you tell us what are those other factors? There's a in the PA system. And it's not just for the games when they're actually eating, but there's lots of practice that they still use the PA practice system. So it's pretty regular. And I will admit also, um, so I went immediately toward fireworks is not the deciding factor. We figured that out. Um, you know, high Corbett, um, I had to distinguish between the activities here at the quad versus high Corbett. There's no PA system. It's a very different set of noises than there is a high Corbett. Um, so it, it, it's truly a high Corbett thing versus a just general baseball field. Thanks for clarifying the parking. So it's, it's basically breaks even on parking. Four was close enough. I mean, we can find seven spots somewhere. No biggie. Um, and I know you've shifted around. Uh, you know, you did the, the walkthrough and you said, that's harder to move than this. Okay, so let's squish it around. Where this, um, the animal welfare. So we want to, we, we're hearing, we're keep, we need more information on that. We need to more thoroughly demonstrate that the animal welfare piece is a critical issue for GMI. That's what I'm here. In, in this uh, claw. <laughs> okay, um, we haven't got to the claw yet, go ahead. Uh, what's the difference between the purple and the green? Okay, so 
Uh, do, before we go to the clock, do, anything else on G minor? Just a, okay. So the, 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 what's shown on the right, which was a kind of a hybrid DG slash the claw, sort of came out of course stakeholder group conversations, but never got to the table or never got a thorough vetting in the course stakeholder group. And it happened very much like the last day, the day after the last day, there was a discussion about what about this idea? And of course, takeout group was whole decided not to reconvene. Having said that, um, I did provide some information on it to mayor and council, you know, because I didn't want an artificial deadline to get in the way of them having full idea, understanding of the ideas. Blue slash purple is the zoo footprint. I'll explain why it's configured the way it is in a second. The green would be reclamation of existing hardscape um, with the exception of the, the, the Northwest green area is, uh, it's sort of half green space right now, but it's not open green space. It's, it's an infield practice field that's fenced off and only used um, by those who reserve and access it, but it's, it's not a heavily used area. So it's not affecting the quad, of baseball fields, but it's taking that area to the Northwest that's not currently open green space, making it open green space. And actually through master planning and public input, what, you know, should that be a passive green space? Should that be an activated green space? That's undetermined, but it's open green space. And then using a significant portion of the maintenance compound for open green space that's currently hardscape closed off in this case, the more human activity elements are still pushed to the north uh, east or the northern part of this, and the habitat is brought to the southwest. This one, this one can operate from a from a animal welfare. It's not perfect, but it's better from an animal welfare standpoint than totally having the habitat up here, habitat's more like here. Having said that, what we also showed, and this is a discussion we need to figure out on what is the future of Randolph Way. Is Randolph Way vehicles or is Randolph Way bikes, pedestrian, and ADA parking? Lakeshore, Lakeshore. What'd I say? Randolph Lake, Lake Shore Lane, sorry. Having said that, what we've drawn here is viewing it through the lens of bike, pedestrian, ADA park user not through the lens of vehicle. But the, the, the tail that comes to the Southwest or South and West is a zoo function element in order to be able to provide, this is a current parking lot, mostly used by the zoo staff anyway. This is the Eastern half of Lake Shore Lane, which is how we can connect maintenance to the Northern area and we can connect animal welfare in the form of accessing back to the to the zoo um, health center, taking the western edge of Lake Shore Lane and making that a multi-use path instead and closing it to vehicle traffic. Emergency vehicles would still have access to where they need to get to because um, there would be a gate on the north and south zoo footprint in order to allow emergency vehicles to get to where they needed to go. But it'd be we'd be closing this part of the park to cars. We have to resolve parking, no doubt. But what this does is generates the primary outcome, preserving Barn Hill and the Duck Pond. We do reclaim a significant portion of Hardscape, either directly into green space or to elements of the zoo. And it's important to note that inside the zoo footprint, it's not all Hardscape. Maybe, whether it's 50 50 what that looks like there's green space and hardscape inside the zoo footprint but there is a net gain of point of about half an acre of green space overall uh, minimal impact to the park experience and, and why i'm describing that is what we've shown here is in lieu of the zoo traffic going over a bridge the zoo traffic is that great, in which case you can have the vehicle, the vehicle access when necessary, and the zoo users 
you know, have, uh, stay at ground level. What we create is what we're referring to as a crow's nest of an elevated bike pedestrian um, ADA accessible high point where you can come from the south, northeast, or what? Well, in this case, west, east, north, or south. You can get to that elevated high point where we could even create an experience at that elevated high point. We've seen examples around the world of where you can create something really cool up there that's only bike, pedestrian, ADA accessible, no vehicles. And then you can, when you go there, you can go in either direction. What this would also do is better activate the AR, uh, 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 Edith Ball Adaptive Rec Center as an element of the park and create more of an environment where um, the very northern edge of ARC is where a future, where, where a splash pad is, in, is programmed under Prop 407, right? Right now, it just isn't a, I'm just gonna admit, where we're gonna put it right now is not the best place in my mind to put a splash pad. You, you would go to the splash pad, you're surrounded by walls, and then you go back out. Here, now it lays it down and turns it into a splash pad that fronts onto a picnic area, open green space, whatever that area could transform into. Okay. Um, Are the children who are going to be waiting in line into the Edith Ball Adaptive Center in the summer, we have a huge line of people outside of that pool in the summer waiting to get in. Um, can they easily access the splash pad from that area? It would be open yeah. now. It's not okay. now. It would be open here. It would be opened up. What it, what it, it's a good question. Yeah, so they would have a, a better uh, access to that slash the pool pools, but also it, it activates the parking lot of the ARC, which right now dead ends at the park maintenance compound. So you, if you're gonna park there, all you're doing is parking there and you're going to the ARC. Here you're parking and now you're open to the, to the, to the, the, the new park features and the future splash pad. Um, I've got a couple of little, I, it's just me, judge me, have you all. I think we can do this for the budget. We'll argue about that later. Um, concerns for zoo experience. This is, I, I don't want to overstate it, but you do have a longer, elongated zoo. So now you come, you know, you've gone all the way down to the zoo, see the elephants. Now you're going to go all the way up and see the tigers. Um, it's not a it's not a deal breaker by any stretch. It's just a fake feature, and I've given it the tentative check mark on animal uh, welfare because now they're they're further away. They're more like five hundred feet away. They're and every foot counts. But and every tree counts. How many trees are going down with this? Uh, in this case, <laughs> there would be. You would you would it, the zoo would be designed to incorporate as many of those trees as possible. The zoo's goal is not to tear down the trees. The zoo's goal is to use the trees. So I'll let- and, Really? Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, the public uses those trees as well. And, and I'm trying to understand how many, um, how many acres are, are going in this area because people are using this area. Ever since the, the zoo took the, the 7.5 acres for the elephants where that soccer field was, that's the last flat right. space for people to fly kites, do balls, uh, you know, run around, picnic. There are quite a few trees there placed with staging in mind already. And is that going over the little thoroughfares sidewalk that go, cuts through the park there? Because right here, excuse me, right here, there are lovely trees all planted that are quite young and in good place specifically made for people to picnic under right next to the larger pond. Um, when you actually go through what you initially decided to do when you came over here, but you were taking almost as many trees as you were here. You just didn't notice it as easily because they weren't in that area. But people do need flat spaces to be able to spread out and have a good time. And the last time I went back past there, there was a kite, they were playing ball, they were picnicking all at once. And you're going to love the next one. <laughs> All right. So we do create accessible flat space that will, it won't be dirt and grass. It would be either a grass field, meadow for the kite flying, whatever. So you're reclaiming the ball field, for public, the ball field for public use. And then creating the new, reclaiming the maintenance compound about, you know, that, that half of the maintenance compound that's being, you know, uh, repurposed 
for flat accessible green space, which um, is going toward that vision that you just outlined. And there's a net gain of about a half an acre. So there's a net gain of a half an acre in this configuration. Right. When you count the ball field. When you count the ball field, absolutely. Which is right yeah. next to the children's playground yeah. and the ice cream truck and, uh, and, you, and a DJ. Yeah. Let's just point that but out. Your, so, but your overall space is broken up into much smaller yeah. little spaces. It doesn't tell you think about the next one. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you're scripting it for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, Go ahead. I have a question, Tim. So uh, if the sound is hard on animals, wh why would we consider that passive, that green space up on the top good for humans? I mean, I, I don't know. It just doesn't make sense. I'm sorry. The, if the park is meant to be a place for passive recreation, as well as some active, and over the years, we've done a pretty good job balancing that. This doesn't look like a balance to me. So I, I can't see, I mean, what Manon is saying is so true. Uh, some of us had our kids on the Randolph uh, soccer team, and that was their field over by the zoo for years. And now kids have, there is no flat space, and, and you say there's something coming up. But this actually just cuts right in, in terms of a user experience for people coming to the park. This interferes to me enormously because all, the, all that flow is gone. Unless you wanted to get rid of that ball field up on top and, and turn it into park space again, which would have been, if you'd had a master plan, that's what people would have supported years ago. They would not have wanted that to be fenced. They would have wanted it left open. And maybe they would have lost, but that's a master plan process would have done that. To correct Molly, what occurred was the Colorado Rockies contract, which was done illegally because it wasn't an open meeting to the public. Colonials wanted to file suit. We won, but then the Colorado Rockies came back and said they'd sue the city for sixteen billion. So, oh, yeah, we have a lot of history. Absorbing it all in. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm having trouble with a couple of the uh, key features here. Yeah, you, you say you could exceed budget limit yes. over on the minor, the likely song. meets budget limit. <laughs> Well, in both scenarios, the four buildings would be displaced, uh, and uh, the for B minor, it's been conceded to work around the welding shop. So I, I, I just cannot see the difference in the two. Uh, that uh, it, in fact, it seems like there would be more configuration issues uh, covering larger space. If anything, would be a higher budget. But I can't see where where it, it is saying it could exceed budget limit on one and likely meets budget limit on the other between these two plans. Uh, the second thing is uh, uh, it uh, generally meets animal welfare needs. Well, it does take some area that's closest to uh, uh, a high corporate field uh, uh, out of the uh, zoo expansion area. But uh, one thing I didn't mention earlier in the discussion Bob and I had about having access between the uh, uh, the uh, maintenance, uh, the remaining maintenance areas in the ball fields is leaving a corridor and uh, on the top edge. And by the time you do that, uh, uh, there, there's not a whole lot of difference between the purple area there and the G minor there. Some, but hardly to the point where you say generally meets animal welfare needs and the other does not. I think what you know, does not you know what you'd want to do. You'd want to get Mark Maselli out there with his decibel meter <laughs> and measure the sound <laughs> at the middle of you know where the G yeah. is on G minor, and then measure the sound Absolutely. 200 feet further south, Absolutely. and then compare right. and say, is it a significant difference? And if it's not a significant difference, then you would have to say that the two are essentially equal in terms of animal welfare. But that would have to be established like with scientific measurement instruments. Not with anyone's opinion. Yeah, we can't just assume that. Yeah. So heard you loud and clear. We need it. To, we need more information on the animal welfare piece relative to noise, sounds, fireworks. Right. Got it. I already admitted we can argue about costs all day long. Got it. You want me to turn that black and say <laughs> meets uh, done? We'll make that edit today. What I'm saying is my professional opinion. This costs more than that. Your professional opinion might be the opposite. 
I, I, but that it's other than the 5.5 million being a cap, we're not going to make the decision based on the 5.5. If one costs 4.8 and one costs 5.2, that's the same. We, what 5.5 gave us is a lot of room to make things work. So mm -hmm. I, I just want to, but I admitted that up front. <laughs> so having said that, let's take a look at the next. Okay. So this is G minor flipped on its head. Give you a second to think about it. Look at it. We still reclaim the all, the vast majority of the maintenance compound in this case we would reclaim that entirely into open green space of, of some of some nature right we know there needs to be some blend of program space and passive green space we get that this is it's, it's almost five acres worth of land um, to work with on that new so this you know, the, the ball field is in that calculation. What it is is still taking down the fence. And then part of that ball field is inside the zoo footprint. Part of that space is outside the zoo footprint, repurposed and made accessible. The area moving, and again, we have to come back to the discussion of Lake Shore Lane. This presumes Lake Shore Lane closed to vehicle traffic and is bike pedestrian ADA traffic. Again, with our crow's nest concept, but now you're going now north, south, east, and west. You've activated the Edith Hall parking lot to be more servicing more things. You've, you've now opened up that splash pad and that park user experience right into the uh, the, the central part of, I was almost going to say the hard part, but I didn't mean to poke a bear there. It's, it's, but it's taking all of that asphalt out of the middle, turning it into green space. How that could be edged, configured, and then what, what along the edge of it needs to be parking to replace parking, you know, try to get to that balance. We know we need a net gain overall in the park, but can this balance on its own? You still have this area, you know, in the connection. You come back, you've got the park um, user able to move through and around and now into a whole big space that's contiguous to create both activated spaces, maybe along the edges, and then maybe creating something more central that can be the passive, quiet, contemplative space surrounded by, you know, open green space or or things of that nature so that this one i'm the rating system i gave it all check marks mm -hmm. um knowing that the it's g minor flipped on its head so instead of the green space being here and the zoo being there we put the green space there and we put the zoo there and have a net gain of a little over 1.3 acres of green space um, I will note, we also know that this conversation doesn't stop with just how does this balance, you heard loud and clear that we're going to be looking all over Reed Park for opportunities to enhance green space, create more of that feature that's not, you know, programming's great, but then there's people who want the unprogrammed, what, where can I go to escape? Could the middle of that be more of a a grove that you can now work your way into and truly escape. That's an idea. It's a thought. It's not vetted with would people value that? I, I think based on everything I heard, they would. Having that much space converted from hardscape into park is where I leave on this one. So thoughts on this one. Okay. Well, I would say that uh, this is not G minor flipped on its head. And I, I would appreciate if you don't use that characterization. What it is, is what was uh, previously called D in effect, with the addition of, mm -hmm. uh, of uh, uh, converting the maintenance yard into green space. Uh, uh, and D was uh, uh, not embraced by the, the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, 
And I, what's just missing in this conversation here is how much people value Barney Dill in the duck ponds. And green space next to a welding shed and the, the uh, surplus building in the ball field is not the same as this area that is heavily used is next to the duck pond yeah. and that, we're, that we're, we're very adamant about preserving. And I understand that we're moving more in the direction of pedestrian and, and uh, bicycle uh, orientation, but the reality is for most families, they come in and they heavily use this parking area to use this area because it's next to the duck pond. If you got, you know, a car full of kids and coolers and uh, get some lawn chairs and all that, you just can't do that on a bicycle. And uh, so we're really back to, to, to the D and the, and the claw. And so we, we've been there on those two. This is not really new other than addition of green space and other areas that you of which becomes uh, questionable. And there's a wonderful little patch. There are other patches of green space within the park that never get used because they're tucked away in these odd crannies. If you go to the west of the practice ball fields, it's open green there, but or not all green, but open. And it's, it's just not a functional area. And just like the Ramada that is uh, north of the barn there, and I'm told it's used quite a bit, the people reserve it, but there's like a green splotch that's south of the blue ballpark building that is north of there. I doubt that that has much functional usage. So, and, and to say that we're going to trade this area that's heavily used now by, by families and park users because of its adjacency to the duck ponds of Barnum Hill, and trade that for something that is separated uh, and, and is, is more compromised because of the, what it's surrounded by, uh, uh, that is just not the same. I'm going to say that the 2,500 people that have um, been speaking to me for six months are uncomfortable with the idea of the zoo moving past Lakeshore Lane at all. The reason for this is because zoos all over the country are in the park space. This is a development aspect of zoological societies that has become quite well known, um, unless you're in Milwaukee and they move the zoo. But you know, we're just not okay with them coming in and us having to look into a zoo. And, and not everybody's comfortable with zoos, not everybody wants to see a zoo, not everybody wants to smell a zoo. And smells are a big deal, sounds are a big deal, not just for the animals, but for the humans around the zoo. And this brings them directly here. And again, we're going to talk about these trees. These trees are public access trees. They're not meant to be behind a wall. A lot of these were planted by Mr. Reed as well. These palm trees have been there a very long time, or most likely grown in a nursery in this park by Mr. Reed himself. Um, you know, we have lovely trees for people to picnic right there. And, you know, once you get a foothold across, as soon as you foothold across Lake Shore Lake, what's going to stop them? Are we suddenly going to break down these wall hills that we never said were possible to break into for green space for the public in another 10 to 12 years? We don't know, but we question. And, you know, at this point, I can guarantee you that the majority of the people who have been speaking to me are not going to go for this. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I think whether or not the zoo expands, if it's expanding, I can see some uh, benefit to this. Uh, but there are a couple things I would want to know. One, I don't see why you have to take out those trees in that green space next to the um, detention basin, whatever that thing is, that cement pond. Um, Could this move up a little bit? Move up sure. north of that lane. Um, I've never quite understood all the figures on the zoo expansion because the acreage changes uh, every time I look at it. That's um, correct. That's and the second principal so concern to me would be the timing, because if the zoo expansion proceeds before the open space, um, there's a good chance the open space would never be reclaimed. That's just the way I see the city having worked in the past. So I think there's a, a real question of whether that's developed. Um, simultaneously was guaranteed that that is developed as well in space. That, that's very fair, and we're on it with you. We're, we're right there with you. I, 
My retirement date is nine years from July 1st of this year. So we got a ways to go. <laughs> no, I'm going to, I just, I, I guess you yes. don't, they have to, if, if, when we proceed in whatever configure, it has to proceed as. Because I, I have to concur with, with Mike on that issue because when I was working with Dan Felix in 2000 and we were doing a master plan, I've stated this before, all that maintenance area was to be moved to the Allen Hall. And that was all being worked out. Unfortunately, Dan passed away from cancer. And literally the excuse was Dan's dead. Seriously, this is what we were told. Dan's dead, we're not doing that. And so that's yeah. what I'm saying. You've heard that too, right? Yeah. So it, it is important that what we work on is signed and there can be legal action taken on it if the city doesn't follow through because that's the game plan that's been played for years. Okay. I'm with you, and I, okay. I, we own that as a city in, in so many ways. I can, our intent and our moving forward need to be in, in alignment. Right. So I, I, I want to apologize if I'm coming off a little anger, I'll show his manner, but it's been, I, I've been so involved for so many years, and I've sat through so many of these master plans, even though they were never approved or followed through. And this is a concern to this larger group now because it's no longer a neighborhood that's been concerned. It's become a citywide issue. And there's a lot of issue with public trust of what's going on with City Hall. And this is why you're reflecting a lot of these people coming through a little bit of anger and, and can we trust you to follow through? I apologize for that because I've, I've been involved for too long. But it is an issue that maybe you can explain to the city and to the mayor and all right now, there is a public trust issue. And with COVID and all, it's really added to it because we haven't had the ability to go to mayor and council meetings. And even if you sign up to be on, you know, one of the uh, call to the audience, you're lucky if you get through. So it, it's just really been an issue. And I think that's kind of some of the problems that we're occurring right now with having these open discussions. And it's well taken. I, I haven't felt Anger, what I felt is calm. <laughs> Frustrating. I took my medication. <laughs> <laughs> what, what I will say is, and I'll just take a moment for myself. I took a little heat over trying to convene this in person. And luckily, we were able to get most of you here, or at least the substitutes and, and, and the, the people who needed to be around the table. And I thank Star and Margo for being with us because I agree with you that that long period of not having, being able to actually look somebody in the eye other than through a rectangle. Is huge, and and we spent a lot of time together, and I've never met most of you in person. So I'm, I'm grateful you all came here today. But that, that we we know there's a trust issue, and we know we need to be good to our word in order to build that. We'll, so, we'll go, Gabe. Hold on, hold on. No, we have to go, Gabe, then Margo. She's had her hand. Oh, I'm sorry, while, Margo. Then back into the sorry, room. Gabe's just up. trying to. Um, <laughs> you guys can call me Bobby. Got me. Sorry. Sorry. Um, I'm just going to point something yeah. out. Um, so I do true valuations for insurance companies, and this little swatch of the people that do is uh, close to like $3 million. So when I see this, like just a simple ratio of like species, there's some younger trees here, but this is millions of dollars of trees that you're going to lose. And I wanted to, you know, make sure we, as like a group, get that data. If that data comes through, where it's like, this is not an acceptable area for you. Like this is, you're gonna lose all that, or what? You can't put animals there. And that tree, besides the emotional value of the tree, the monetary value alone of this tree is huge. And so I just want to point that out. Like we talk about the stage, talk about this is a part trees for people to visit instead you're going to take an oasis and put a cage and who, who knows if the report zoological site is solvent in 50 years if they exist in 100 years but the green space will so that's just what i need you know to put out there because i'm getting a little like you know what i mean <laughs> and and this, and this is where it says minimize use of green space well this takes a vast section of green space. It wasn't have an outcome with the net gain of green space. It was minimized 
the use of green space, i.e. existing green space. And, and this just takes a, a massive uh, chunk of uh, green space. And <clears throat> I'd reiterate uh, Manon's comment earlier, our neighborhood association is re on record that this is not going to the west of Lake Shore Lane as well. So no, I will say we've had this very conversation. Reason, one of the reasons we had never seen much materials before today is we always do a set of one-on-one -on -one briefings for every council to make sure we're following their direction as closely as possible. We owe that to them. They make a decision. We're their staff carrying it out. We meet with them individually. The last the last one-on-one -on -one briefing was yesterday. So we literally, you're one day after mayor and council receiving us. We talked through this. So they've seen these and we've talked through that. So we are, we are admittedly interpreting a net gain of green space as being compliant with mayor and council spirit and intent when they made the motion. No, that's not what the words say. I understand that. So that's why we've been talking directly to each of them about what we're doing here. Because that's, that's what we do is they give us direction and we don't. Maybe at times we just run off and do the thing best as we figure we think we're following their direction. And sometimes we're not. So we, we are talking to them regularly to make sure we're in alignment. Having said that, Hi there. Hello. It's been a great conversation and it's wonderful to listen in. And um, thank you to the new voices. I'm learning how to put your names with your voices. My, my questions were, were two. One is um, I'm really um, in sync with this thing about the cars to, to bring all your equipment and your picnic basket and all those things. How you would access that new uh, open space, that re, um, the re, uh, reconfigured um, hardscape, the redeveloped hardscape into green space. One, where you see that access point. And of course, it's totally devoid of trees. So that would be one of the first issues is where you're going to get the mature trees to put into there. And the second one is, was not clear to me what this hatched area is in blue and white with the long um, tail, I think it was called earlier. Does that go into the zoo? And that's where they gain some maintenance and so forth space. And, and how do the person walks I guess from the entry point, it would be shorter into the tiger area, but from the elephants, it would be quite a long walk. So, so what is, uh, how do you access the redeveloped uh, hardscape and what is this striped area? Thank you. Thanks, um, regarding accessing the new green space, there is the ARC parking lot, which is currently blocked off from everything, but now we opened up immediately adjacent to the new green space Okay. and the uh, splash pad. It's not on the slide, it's not evident, but Lakeshore Lane comes from the north and there's parking uh, up there. Now, what also, um, there was a discussion a little bit about having that like corridor between, if, if the zoo in G minor was up there, having a corridor for vehicle maintenance access between that you know northern edge of the zoo and mm -hmm. the southern edge of the high corporate compound. That's, it's not real evident, but we, we show that here as having a gap there, would some elements of that gap now be parking along the green space? Would that something we would figure out and work together on? It? How, 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 so you definitely have two entry points that are vehicle accessible. You actually have the entire space activated through bike pedestrian ADA to, we talked about the elevated pathway, but the, but the black line is just an example of, and would it cut through the middle? You know, does it make sense or should it be to the edge? Do you create a grove? We can route that. But could would, would the edge of that now have just, you know, parking to both balance, but also give, what we want to do is provide parking nearest the thing that we want activated, but mm -hmm. then buffer things that you want people to be able to explore more on foot or on bike. But that's the answer to that one. Okay. The other uh, one was the tail. The tail. <laughs> tail. Sorry, it's, it's only hatch flu here because we're, we want to talk about phasing. If we went down this path or or the claw, um, it would it it so that would be inside the zoo footprint, but it's not habitat area. It's the maintenance access and emergency vehicle access, and we would we would be able to do that sooner 
because it would comport with doing the, the World of Play project, which is on hold, not because it was expanding into Barnum Hill, but it's on hold because it was on, uh, between current zoo footprint and Barnum Hill, and we've already moved. There's things happening inside the zoo footprint, you know, the flamingo habitat moved and expanded, and then there were things that were coming behind that. So we'd be able to activate that project while we're doing the master plan and while we're doing the redesign, whether it's here or somewhere else. That's a common element to everything is being able to provide that um, access and space. Okay, thank okay. you. You were so close. <laughs> you <thought it> was <laughs> Mind you, quick. Just, you can also expand the Edith Ball parking uh, into that area that's just got some stray maintenance on it. Yeah, that's, that's correct. I didn't, I didn't wanna no, not further poke further any over bears. To the east. But in the existing hardscape area, you could create more park, you could expand that Edith Ball parking lot. I will tell you one of the thoughts I had was, which it's not gonna work, and I don't think it would be popular, was actually you could, in, in a little green space through here, you could actually connect those parking lots. And so somebody could drive from one side to the other, things of that nature. But I think it's, I think if, you're, if one of the goals is to have some insulated space in the middle of the city where you can escape from it all by moving away from the parking lots as far as you choose to go cutting that off would 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 take away from that so i i didn't show that because i i, just didn't, I think it's it's self-defeating i have a question how am i going to walk to either fall without the um, aquatics in on my home the setup as it stands now i can walk from Treat and Eastland directly across to the Edith Dell, and I don't have to drive, or I can bike across very easily. This completely cuts off my access. You come in from the west. You go through the, the pathway. Here's There's a bike a, overpass. A bike it's, bike bike pass. Pass. it's like yeah. a pedestrian it's bike bridge. Like yeah, right. there's a little yeah. elevated point where once you get up there, you can you can if you wanted to keep going east or west or something. So you'd actually yeah. have that. To the point of order, people are jumping in, and I know Mike and Margaret are waiting okay. a long time. I was going Mike and respect people who have their hands up. I'll yield because, uh, as Meredith said, she's had her hand up, and so is and, and yeah, and then like I love the self policing group. Let's go here. <laughs> <laughs> to my mind, the net gain of the 1.32 acres is not equivalent. To having the zoo expansion with walls, it's, it's not the same thing. Giving up the space that's north of the duck pond, which has mature growth, to get hardscape that's going to be re-evaluated, it's going to have young trees. It's not going to have the same atmosphere at all, and the visual is going to be very different when you're going from 22nd Street and you're walking through or you're biking through, and all of a sudden there's a large area that's then enclosed. And you can't even, you won't even have a visual of that net gain. I, I don't see this as a positive. I see that as um, a red herring. Uh, unfortunately, putting the zoo there brings up the exact same issue as the Barnum Hill South Duck Pond area. That's the most aesthetically pleasing part of the park. That's where people are attracted to. And this new area to the Northeast is gonna be surrounded by walls. And the open part of it will be facing the city surplus or what's left of it. So that would be a very unesthetically pleasing park area. Um, that's my comment. Thanks, Tim, for um, pushing all these puzzle pieces around in this completely locked in puzzle. Um, really, I, I do appreciate it. And um, it, this thing that this, this looks like a little like D, uh, I'm sort of forgetting, but the one thing that people have brought up is this is where people come to the park. They wanna be around the water. They, they want to be in this location. This is, um, I mean, Barnum Hill and the Duck Pond was also about everything around that bigger, like this is the heart of the park. It's where people come. 
And so you would actually just be walling off um, a whole bunch of uh, parkland. Uh, so I don't see a checklist, a check over there for park or experience. Um, I, I don't see it checked off. So, I, and I see why it's not checked off because this actually lessens the park or experience. I, I don't know what the answers are, but I think it would be good for us to understand about the money here because we were originally, I forget the figure, but mayor and council said that we could go over, um, you know, with G minor, if it went over a certain amount, um, Bob, five and a half, so five point five, that it would be acceptable. So I, I don't know where we are. I don't know what took us over. <clears throat> and to develop, I know as a council person, to develop a large swath of land into a really nice park, um, passive and maybe some field or whatever, is very expensive. Yeah, that part. Excuse me. That part kind of defies logic because if the zoo expansion went on to the hardscape area, then the existing parkland doesn't have to be recreated, it exists. So I fail to see how turning five acres of asphalt into park and then locating the zoo into existing parkland costs less than relocating the zoo to the hardscape. But, but those again, like you say, these are discussions that could be had. Here's two of the big rocks related to that. But, but we should see those figures. I mean, that would be great to see the figures, just like the decibel levels for the different areas for animal welfare. That's important because we are now down to that point. We are basing our decision on these things and we don't have the details. Okay, so cost opinions for everything, except for this one, have been shared. Roundly criticized, but that's okay. They've been shared. I will add one for this, not a problem. That's easy. Having said that, reclaiming that the hardscape area in the zoo is very similar than reclaiming the hardscape into green space, although the green space could be less expensive because you don't reclaim the hardscape in the zoo by just taking down the building. You have to actually reclaim the land beneath it, just like you would do for the zoo. The difference is any utilities running underneath that can occupy space with green space where they might need to be relocated if you're actually building buildings and things on top of it. So the, there's a co the cost difference between converting that into zoo, that's one of the items, is it's not, um, they both have the same level of like reclaiming the land, but for example, this area here, if you were, and I know we've moved G minor around to maybe avoid some or most of that, but there's all kinds of buried utilities through there that can be compatible with green space that might not be compatible with the zoo. The zoo might have to relocate, relocate those utilities. The other million dollar difference, maybe, is the configuration of the zoo redesign going into the claw and to a large degree going into G minor is a very comprehensive redesign. Now I know we have the buildings, but the buildings are all associated with the habitat. They've gone through all that work. So a redesign is going to cost money. This footprint is, is literally flipping the zoo design that we have all over. So it will save significant money on the redesign. So there's a constructability difference and a design difference that yes, that's going to cost quite a bit of money but the other two items are where I see it, you know. So you could put the AutoCAD on mirror function and flip the design that was going to go south. So it's really the original zoo expansion flipped on its head, not G minor flipped on its head. But Fair enough. I would argue, and I, had, I didn't want to go there, G minor has no bearing to G. This was D. <laughs> yeah. This was D. That's D plus. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so so let's just get let's 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 get let's get the new letter. New letter. Yeah. New letter. Was D plus. Uh, well, we started. Well, yeah. The, 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 the bandaid off. Yeah, the way we got G minor was we had G north expansion, yeah. and then we moved it further north <laughs> and started taking things out. So yeah. So we have Meredith, then Mark, then Phil. Okay. Yeah, I, mean, I think what I hear is fair, certainly given all the conversations we've been in together. And I think what I hear pretty resoundingly is this is a really difficult model for the work that's been done in terms of consuming that space. It may work for lots of other, other 
I mean, it's a trade-off, but I think it becoming a choke, a choke point at the park, taking away that sort of space that doesn't have a lot of hardscape, doesn't have you know walls. Yes, you could turn that into greenscape, but again, it's against walls, it's against buildings. Very different feel of the quality of the park. I feel like still is something we need to be able to hold on to. And that that essentially over constraints it. But I'm kind of curious to go back to the fall, right? Because because at the end of, at the end of the day, I hear you know G G minor is not acceptable for animal safety. I, I hear that, right? Um, but I I would actually ask, is there, you know, and I we have hardscape that are parking lots, and you have space that could be repurposed further out for parking lots. Have we done enough significant work to think about how do you absolutely minimize and still create tighter scape? Because I think that's what you're trying to do, that is not so imposed into that um, flat field area and allows the, the zoo not to choke the movement of people across east and west in ways that are meaningful. So I feel like I, I feel like what I'm hearing is, you know, that your your proposal that you're excited about is probably largely troubling to almost everybody from the neighborhood group who's at the table, right? So, and that's significant. I hear that, and I I certainly would add my voice to that. But it feels to me like there's a piece of work to say the kinds of things. It's a hard balance, and if you want animals, right, you're going to trade that with a lot of work that's been done. To think about what is that space to be in? It's not just about green space, it's about that open space at the core of the park. So it's a it's a hard, it's a hard design solution. We have some good design thinkers at the table, thank you very much. Um, but I think in the context of neighborhoods, that would be a hard thing to it, it's not just quantity, it's quality exactly. of green space. That's exactly. So it's nice on that chart for where we're in that discussion, were you alluding to that this might be with some rework closer to what might be an acceptable outcome than, than the other one. Is that what I'm saying? Hands down. Okay. No. What I want to say is diversionary, mean spirited, divisive, and it's not a good idea. But I'm not. My problem is coming from where I am now. Talk about community. And I think is there are communities out there. And if you go back to the original city survey of the concepts, you can see got the most positive votes. And D was the highest net neutrality or the best net neutrality. But more specifically, in terms of what the community wants, I spent a half an hour with a group of people who yelled at me because they were angry that we were keeping the duck pond. Give me a break. Did I say anything? No, because they weren't talking about ducks. It was just, they were mad politically about other things. This drives me crazy. What, what I like is what's going now, going on now, is we're investigating, still investigating options and focusing on outcomes and ultimately achieving a consensus. And Bob Fed, I'm glad you're here today because my suspicion is that through your life, the majority of your time has been spent on listening to people And achieving those consensus yeah, and that consensus and putting it down on paper, which ultimately <clears throat> becomes a reality. And that's that's what I would hope we end up with. 
for today's news. You've got your list of things that you need to look at further. But somehow, I think we're moving closer to what's called yes. You're welcome. I just want to apologize. I have to leave because I have to close up Mission Garden, which is, I understand what everybody's going through here as far as planning and funding and <laughs> working with archaeology, which you don't have to work with. But uh, I, I really appreciate every, everybody's time and input. Um, but I have to go. Please come visit Mission Garden. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Garlic Festival next week. Garlic Festival next week. Oh, Bill was too gracious to call it. <laughs> yeah, my problem with the, this one, the hybrid cloth, is still that it breaks up so much of the open space uh, that you don't have uh, fields where kids can just go and play around. Um, I do appreciate what Manon was saying. I, I, you have to preserve that line. Um, that goes basically south of that pathway that has all the trees. And the trees that then connected up to the parking lot for the zoo. You're you're yeah. 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 And, and the other part I don't really understand. I mean, you can have a, we can have a requirement that none of the trees are cut down. They're designed around. Um, you still have the problem in doing that other part. You don't have mature trees, which is going to have dealt with some way. The other part is how much space does a zoo actually need? Um, maybe it needs a little less space um, because animal welfare needs to be accommodated. And so maybe you can't go as far north. Uh, maybe some of the human elements get taken out of that. It's condensed down. Are you talking about the safari launch? Yeah. Yeah. I'd also note uh, uh, on, on this one here, uh, if this generally meets animal welfare needs, uh, it was noted earlier by myself and Bob Ben looking at uh, uh, keeping some storage and uh, uh, access lane to the practice fields on the north tier uh, that, uh, that certainly G minor could be would be reworked to, to meet the distance that you're showing there from the uh, ball field. Uh, uh, that would uh, require cutting more into some parking area, but uh, uh, that uh, the design alone is showing uh, a fair amount of green space to the east and southeast that uh, could be used for the uh, expansion that uh, would be further from the ball field than the uh, closest point on that purple space. So. So if we're if we can get down to parameters, we're we're, we're uh, dealing with uh, uh, exactly what spatiality is is needed. Then then it's possible to maybe uh, encroach further into the parking area at the west, to the west, and then figure out how to handle <clears throat> parking needs. But uh, you know, like, uh, I mean, certainly that purple area there, if, it, if that generally meets animal welfare needs, then. Then certainly uh, uh, it's within a, it, 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 at least uh, some kind of striking di uh, distance of a redesign that uh, creates a little bit more buffer between the uh, uh, zoo expansion area and the fence of the ball field. Yeah. So I just want to make sure I'm hearing you um, and, and clarifying the habitat areas in this configuration are toward the west. The more human elements, which we can you know, for, for discussion is up here. What I'm hearing you say is, and I think I'm hearing, the current green space is more valuable than future green space, even if it's more. I don't know how I feel about that, but that's what I'm hearing. But a shifting this footprint in order to, um, right now it takes, you know, Shifting this footprint so that it better preserves this lake shore, the lake front. No, no, maybe I should just say it rather than Go ahead. characterize what I'm saying. I, what I'm saying is taking G minor, but reworking G minor 
uh, perhaps to go west into some of those parking spaces and and uh, further uh, and, and bring the top boundary further to the south, so it would be more equivalent to to the purple space in in this rendering here. I'm not talking about reworking this rendering, but just looking at the distance from the ball field that they, that, that your own document says generally meets animal welfare, and trying to work within that. G rework G minor within that parameter. Okay, so that's to reflecting that back to you is here's where the habitat relative to G minor, here's where the habitat meets animal welfare, right? Here's where the habitat does it. If it's preferable. No, here's where it does according to your own. As I've said a number of times, the habitat's here. Right? The habitat is here. That's not the habitat. It's inside the zoo. The habitat is here. Right. I think what Mark is saying, let me see if I understand that. I think what Mark is saying is take that critical hybrid habitat instead of here, it's here. You shift it east. Because originally we were trying to preserve this parking area. We're saying, all right, lose all that parking. That's habitat. Save all of this. Pull this down to a service loop with storage. Your human activities can go up here. But I would need to actually, a friend of mine is Tom Spenderi. He's an architect. He's a business partner with Martin Sally, the acoustic one. Mm -hmm. He's got a decibel with it. Get high corporate to fire up their PA sometime. Measure the decibels here, measure the decibels here, measure the decibels here, see what they really are. And then we, we're not guessing whether this is a better habitat than this. We would actually have a yes. So, and uh, Tom's a friend of mine, I bet I could get him to do that free of charge. <laughs> and then we'd have some facts. So we heard that. More investigation on the animal welfare is necessary. Yeah. We understand that. We're mm -hmm. with you. Mm -hmm. Saying we don't have facts now is where I would make well, the argument. We don't have we... measurements. So there we go. Having said that, if there's a sweet spot, if you will, somewhere between here and here, mm -hmm. and I don't care which footprint we start with, that meets all of the criteria, which this footprint does not, this footprint from some of the criteria, maybe closer, but if it's, and then the other one, which I gave all check marks do, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> what I would ask is, where was the zoo, the city, and would we be invited to the discussion that develops the revised G minor, which we were not invited to any of that led up to that? Oh. Yeah, sure. yeah. Well, it was evolving uh, out of our discussions, but sure, sure. I'd like to because be if we're going to get there, we have to do it together. Right. I agree, and then and that was the point of this. Sure, sure. Right. Well, then, I guess our point was we were kind of hoping to hear from you over the last two months and right. didn't. And uh, right. I've been super busy running my office and meeting deadlines and having a life, and I was hoping to hear from you, and I was glad to finally hear from you. But we weren't part of developing this. Now I think. I like your idea of this kind of like head overpass. And I agree, that could be a really cool structure. Mm -hmm. That could be like you know, three big arches and plant it like the High Line in New York. You know what I'm saying? Make it, oops, make it a, uh, make it a happening, you know, make it a, a feature. And, and then Nancy was, you were into that. You, you were saying there's, you've seen zoos that have bridges and they actually are kind of interesting. You know, it yeah, adds that vertical element. Um, the, added interest is once you get up, elevated, now you can see all around, you see into the zoo, right? You see the mountains you, and it's, it could enhance the experience, both the park goers and zoo goers. Whether the bridge is for the zoo or for the park user, that's, you know, either way, as long as you preserve that connectivity, because you need people to be able to get back and forth. Because some people who just come to the park might go, oh, hey, there's the zoo, let's go see the zoo. If it's cut off, that won't happen. They're not going to go back to their cars, drive around, come in. So I think that free flow, it's all about the flow of people through the park. Um, and I, but I agree, Tim. I think we should all sit at the table together rather than us coming up with something and then you coming up with something and then we get together and they don't match. But let's sit down. I'd be, I would welcome that. And I just found out also a guy that I've known for years uh, who used to live here and moved back to New Orleans um, is on, on the James Day Rosal. He's a landscape architect. He and his, his wife, uh, Florencia Turco, they're good friends of mine. I was at their wedding and I, I didn't realize he was on the design team. 
uh, uh, you know, because he uh, he's, he's actually a Cajun from Louisiana, and he will, he went home to home, and he's on he works for Torrey Design, and I had no idea, and I kind of wish he'd reached out to me early on, and I I'm sure the fact that he spent years in Tucson was a plus for their team getting the job, um, but I, I think yeah we'd love to work with you Tim, and I'm sure there's a solution that would meet all of your criteria. And yeah. certainly when we put forward the G minor plan, it was a full week before the mayor council meeting. Uh, and, and it was presented to the city manager's office by the Ward 5 office with the, the, the uh, request that Bob Bent be contacted on that plan. And that never happened. And then uh, uh, I sent in on behalf of the team uh, a whole checklist of items that came out of our tour and how it affects G minor and provided to Laura Hemway. And we never heard anything back on that. So it's not like we haven't provided stuff and not like your office hasn't been contacted about working with us. And that somehow the fact that we came up with an alternative, uh, uh, it, it, we never said that that was the exact precise last word. Uh, it was just something that looked like a solution to a problem uh, in, in concept, and uh, we, we never got any, any feedback on that. Matter of fact, the term G minor never seems to have been even uttered in any space until today. Well, Tim and I did trade phone calls, but we missed each other. Right. And he called me, and I was busy in a site meeting, and I called him, and he was busy. So we made an effort to communicate. But that was on the day of the vote, so it was a little late in the game. Um, to go back to the claw, um, I think there are two parts of it as I look at it. That uh, One part that really crystallizes what Molly was saying earlier is you look, there are actually two shades of purple. And what I'm hearing is the darker shade of purple is habitat. Lighter shade is human activity. Well, how are we taking away public space? I understand the zoo needs a way that it makes more money and be more sustainable. But that's a major decision to say we're taking away open public space for human activity inside the zoo you pay for, which is really what that all light blue stuff is. Um, that's a master planning issue. You're closing off the access of Lakeshore Drive. That's a master planning issue. I don't see how um, you can do the claw without doing the master planning and addressing, do we really want to trade? Um, open space for all of everybody who's around here for zoo space that is for human activities that makes money. Can I just make a quick clarification? I don't think there was an intent to do darker light purple. I think it's just the colors in the Yeah, it's the and green what space it is, and hardscape. Is, well, that's um, where his hand was. His hand yeah. was over the no, dark space as habitat. Right. And what I wanted to clarify is that it's less sensitive animals as well as people areas and then um, the more sensitive animals further, further away. away. So right. it's not that there's no habitat supplement there. Gotcha. And of course until we design I don't know what else. So I heard something I think was pretty critical, which was one reason to do your ultimate proposal is because you can reutilize all the design that's been done by the mirror. And that seems like that's there's a cost to that to not redesign. And that seems to be a major factor in this, this, this recommendation. So I guess that, and then together with the other cost estimate that suggests it would be less expensive to turn the hardscape into park rather than turning it into zoo. Um, and my, you, you mentioned, I believe, that you could design around the trees maybe if you do this expansion into the green space. Another thing you can design around is utilities. We do it all the time. When you've got a major utility corridor, that's a design constraint and you work around it. You, um, and I, 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 I brought this, I, we knew there'd be show and tell, so I brought a show and tell. My experience in terms of this type of design is with the Desert Museum, where we're actually the last quarter century off and on have done several projects with it. And so I understand their concerns. I know it's, this is another zoo, right? let's say so. The Desert right. Museum is a botanical garden and a zoo, zoological garden, botanical garden. Um, and one of, one of the things I've done for them uh, well, our bridges, I've done four bridges for them, which is all about opening up areas that previously were inaccessible to the handicap because of washes and ravines, they couldn't get people across in an accessible manner. And the whole Arizona Uplands exhibit, which they expanded into here, is based on bridges. 
Uh, the main entrance was the first thing I did for them. You've been to the Desert Museum, you've walked through one of my designs, which was the entry plaza uh, and new ticketing window. Um, we had to access, we made it all accessible. Instead of like steps and ramps, it's a 20, uh, one in 20 slope. So it's just a warped plane, it's not a ramp. We did little snakes slithering to the entrance. Uh, and then uh, just most recently in 2018, we completed the pack rat playhouse for them, which was they wanted to create a place where people could come inside, actually conditioned underground building, place for parents to take their kids in the summer, um, which opened and then closed with a pandemic. But it will be. Um, this is the mixed species exhibit. Um, I did a video display in the hummingbird thing so you could see the birds flap their wings. But uh, this, I think the bridge is the key, whether it's a bicycle bridge or it's a zoo bridge to connect the North Zoo to the South Zoo. Uh, and of course, the Desert Museum is really spread out, you know, and it has distinct sectors that are connected with walkways. And I know that was one of the goals of the director, the Hancock, when I started working here. We we're so crowded with visitors, we have to spread them out, which is a good problem to have, right? So you need some different areas that visitors can, can, can spread out in. Um, so the other thing that I learned working with the Desert Museum is a very economical way to build bridges, and the city should take them. Mm -hmm. There is a company in town, there's a father and son, Tom Sacra, Alan Sacra. Yes. They do thin shells, gunite, concrete, and that's how we built the Packrat Playhouse for mm -hmm. a really affordable price. Uh, it was a 90 foot long by 45 foot span, six inches of concrete. It was earth formed. And so it's like an eggshell. It, it's super, like if they did a flat slab concrete, a waffle slab, it'd have to be four feet thick to carry all the earth. But by utilizing this thin shell technology and soil earth interaction, because then after you build the arch, you backfill over it and that helps stabilize it. So you can, I got a, I actually got a written quote from Alan Sacra. They are design build engineers. $200,000 for a bridge. And I said, well, that's just the head walls and the arch. Now you have to backfill it and I have to face it. Like this is one of their bridges faced with stone. So it becomes an aesthetic thing. It's not just a concrete culvert, it's a bridge. And so I think there's some people here in town who could really help us, whether they're building an overpass for the zoo or whether they're building a bike head overpass. I think you, you'd, you'd be hard pressed to find anyone who could do it more efficiently, economically, or beautifully. And they're right here in Tucson. They don't have to go out of town for that. So, I mean, these are just things that my experience has been, we can look within and we can find solutions. And that's all that we were interested in. When I jumped into this thing, it was like, I voted for the zoo with the tax. I thought it was great. You know, I'd love to improve the zoo. Um, but I, when I found out it was expanding into the park, I said, oh, wait a minute, that's not what we voted for. And Mark's an old friend and we got back together and brainstormed and up came this G minor idea. Uh, and I guess uh, we think that it has merit to, uh, but it should be evaluated and we should, we should actually evaluate it. We should take decibel measurements and see what really is uh, acceptable animal habitat. But when you mention a $200,000 cost, you're not talking about that, that H span right there where you've got to have vehicular traffic that goes two ways, that's going to be able to support transportation of vehicles and animals back and forth yeah. and walkways for pedestrians. Yes. And, and, yes. 200,000 a span. And I've got two spans. So I doubled it to 400. And then I added 100,000 for the backfill. The thing is, these things are incredibly strong uh, in compression. And what you do is they're filled with earth. So that you can plant trees on the bridge, like the High Line. I mean, it's, it's and that's what we did at the, the Packard Playhouse. It's an underground build. It's, there's plants on the roof. You wouldn't know it was a building. It's completely buried. How long of a span did you envision? Because you have ADA requirements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what you do there is you've got the, the bridges are fairly shallow and they're slope. Uh, and uh, let's see, I think I have some of their, of their things. So you can do a very shallow slope, a 50 foot radius, and the span can be whatever you want, but they have standard forms that give you the 50 foot. And then what you do with the handicap is if it's 120 slope or, uh, or less, it's not a ramp. So you do the crown of the bridge at 1 and 20. When you get to where it has to be steeper, one in 12 is a handicap ramp. And one thing we can do is we do a little bit of a zigzag. The ramp goes this way and that way, and there's steps in between. The ramp goes this way, this way, then there's steps. So in a couple of runs, you're up on the shallow part. So it can be designed um, and, and, and have full handicap accessibility. The other thing with these bridges that Tom and Alan do, they could be, you know, why? It could be 50, 60, 
you know, hundred foot wide bridge, you can have displays on the bridge. You can actually have animal habitat on the bridge. You can run utilities over the bridge in the earth fill area, which is what we've done. So I'm just saying that it's uh, the, the bridge concept was part and parcel of G minor. Like, okay, if you're going to have a north zoo and a south zoo, they have to be tied together. Um, and with my experience, you know, working with the Sakers, um, who I think could qualify for the city as a unique vendor of service, there's nobody else doing this. And with the benefit of the city, um, which would save significant amounts of money, uh, no matter what kind of bridge you build, I think they really, they should be at the table because they bring their innovative engineering forward. Um, so. Uh, uh, our time is up. I know people probably have to go. Um, this has been a good meeting, lots of good input. And um, it seems like if, if you could bring in people like Mark and Bob it, to the table so there could be a discussion about things, you know, not months apart, but not apart at all, all there, uh, we might be able to get somewhere. We, we just can't have this where people don't know anything that's going on and you know, and then we come together and we're sort of back to square one in some ways, though I appreciate the opening up of green space that you did. I, well, I heard that that's exactly what's going to happen. Yeah, I just want to confirm that well, that, that is what's going to happen. I mean, I just heard it, I heard a comment about it, but that that, that will actually formally happen when we leave this meeting. So. Thank you for leading us to leading. That's what we, we need, but we need a clarity coming out of it. So I think so, yeah. yeah. Can I ask a quick question? Oh, I just wanted to go back to the PA and the welfare. Um, this whole next to me put in a PA system that you can quite loud. And when I asked them to turn it down, they were able to turn it down and it was still quite effective for their needs. Is it possible to turn down? We asked the question, which is a possible to um, to turn down the PA system slightly for it still to be um, effective for their needs, but so it doesn't radiate out as far. We can put that on the list of things. So that, um, I don't know that we will add the PA to that. Now that would replicate uh, what uh, I think Bill was talking about earlier. We had horrific problems with the noise from uh, the uh, big concerts at the Demeester, and it the solution, and, and Tom Spenderian was involved in that, was to set up a different uh, uh, audio system with speakers actually out in the audience so that the audience get the same audio levels, but it was concentrated on the uh, audience area rather than being projected literally a half mile or more into our neighborhood. And mm -hmm. uh, you might remember, Molly, that was a very difficult was. problem dealing with parks and recreation on that. So, so finally, uh, after Spendarian's you know, data showed that uh, we weren't just making things up in the neighborhood, uh, 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 we were able to get resolution. I'm hearing the next step that is a little bit more charrette like, a little bit less ours and yours, <laughs> yeah. which, which, which is all good. We needed to get to that place. I'm also hearing more interest in what's on this screen than what was on the other screen from most people over here. And I'm including both because, in order to address animal welfare with data, the sensitive species we believe need to be further away than, and, and I know I'm pointing at an old Jeep, right? So we need to be somewhere in this space where we understand we have to meet all the criteria, which includes animal welfare, um, but um, the preservation of as much of this, especially along the lake, is of high value. So while this will shift in order to meet all the criteria, minimize the shift. Is that true with everybody? Okay. Well, I don't know that, that we're to the point of agreeing anything going west to Lakeshore Drive. I think that's a function sitting down at the table and 
and seeing what works and what doesn't. There are many other people that need to be consulted as well as other neighborhoods. Sure. Uh, well. with, with all respect, that's exactly what the mayor and council, that was part of their direction. And so Tim was following through on their motion. The motion was to minimize the use of green space. Part of their motion. But their, but their motion was proceed the proceed with the redesign of the zoo expansion into the area north and west of the Edith Ball Adaptive Recreation Center. Well, G now minor, whether they G meant minor that or does not, that. whether they meant that or not, do we know what that's what they told Tim to do. And nobody's arguing that G minor doesn't meet the geography. I'm arguing this meets the geography. I'm arguing the other one meets the geography. They're all correct. correct. Thank you. I'm arguing, based on the information I have, not backed by measurements yet, that that's too close to high foot. Okay, for the animal welfare. So our next step would be work the problem. No. Too, too, too close based on fireworks based on crowd sound. I mean, when you say too close. Crowd, crowd sound, yeah. it's all free right now. Right. Current condition is fireworks, PA system, crowd sound. We're gonna go and try to get rid of the fireworks. Regardless, give me 23 years <laughs> and lots of your support. <laughs> it won't take 23 years. But it is a crowd noise issue to our current understanding. And a PA issue to our current understanding. We will investigate whether the PA could be altered. And we will investigate what is the penetration of crowd noise so that we understand how close is too close. But, and is there a significant difference between the two? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yes. What's the you know, what's the decibel level in the heart of G minor and what's the decibel level in the heart of the claw? And just look at the measurements. Um, I know ballparks keep pumping the sound level, which is not pleasant. I mean, they're getting louder and louder and louder because they're That's trying right. to get fans, you know, ginned up. Uh, so PA systems are getting, I think PA is probably a bigger problem than crowd noise, uh, you know, because they play snippets of songs in between and they're trying to get everyone jacked up. So that, you know, that would be maybe a bigger issue than the crowd, but it is an issue, I understand. But certainly just past 4th of July with all the fireworks, anyone with a pet knows that that's freak out when there's loud sounds. So, so uh, and there's more than one way to address those noises. One is footprint, one is the generation of those noises and how they occur. But the other part of the crowd the noise was the unpredictability mm -hmm. of that. Yeah. And well, the other, can I just say, Tim, yeah, you absolutely. focused a lot on the, because I, I focused on the crowd noise, the system, the crowd, the fireworks, but then there's also the overall vibrations, sound, those are things that we want to consider. And also for zoo operation and user experience, um, G minor is far more complicated because on that H, on that bridge, it's not just pedestrians and a pickup truck, it's boom lifts and heavy equipment going over to access G. Just they can so take it. These shells can take anything and throw it. But, all, but the, it creates that park experience. Yeah, that there right. Was a so there you go. Versus pedestrians. Gotcha. The commingling of the use is what you're yeah. talking about. Yeah. Well, so the important thing is the separation of traffic, right? And allowing the zoo to flow through. So if a bike pad overpass works better, that's the better option. Yeah, that might be. The, you know, yeah, that's that's what I'm going to say. I want the bridge. Okay. Zoo, zoo, zoo customers have their cool stuff. Yeah. I want the bridge. Yeah. <laughs> I want the yeah, yeah. I, it could be a super thing. Really 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 yeah. yeah. I'm seeing a three span arch. It would be fabulous. That's the whole thing you don't have to do. <laughs> and also for artwork, since the RTA has value engineered downtown lights of all the cool stuff. Simon Donovan and the other artists will probably still have their stuff in storage. And Sounds good. Really <laughs> We're going to wrap up here in a second, but go ahead, Mike. I'd like to at least keep that other option on the table because this one still bothers me in terms of breaking up all the open space, making it less uh, contiguous, and also just the extensive fencing. 
that is going to be around because this gives a much larger appearance of what the zoo footprint is. And with keeping that other option on in discussion at least, considering lessening the area that the zoo expands to. Maybe we don't need to have a zoo expansion as big as they're looking at. Maybe we can fit that into a design that can be people's interest. So we, fair enough, that, that's a good point. Somewhere in the middle of these three ideas <laughs> is the answer. Very I'm confident yeah. in that yeah. because I'm gonna say one, one of the answers is a zoo expansion. I think we have absolute clarity from mayor and council that there will be a zoo expansion. And I have crystal clear direction to redesign it and make that happen. But you don't have direction for this amount to, to either take from the park or take from the zoo expansion. So you don't have that direction. I agree with you. So that, that is all part of that discussion of how much is needed, how do we configure it, and where does it go? And then in all of these, the, the goal and i think the thinking was preserving a great zoo experience and preserving a great park experience and we might have some spectrum of what people think that means yeah, yeah. no there's got to be a compromise that's the nature of reaching consensus well, g minor in itself is exactly. a compromise yes. I yeah mean, this, this <laughs> moving the goalpost kind of thing i'm not again saying that it has to specifically be g minor in this no. discussion but the idea yeah. that g minor is the starting point and then you compromise for that well then it that. evolves and it takes yeah. on its own life every design does that there comes a point when the design just goes where it wants to go Precisely. i think the key thing is connectivity yeah. to maintain connectivity for the park and bringing people through zoo plaza and also around the ponds at Lorman hill yeah. Um, so I agree with you, Tim. There is a solution here, and we're getting closer to it. So thanks for organizing this. And I'll so. just echo that thought as well, that um, everybody's brought a lot of good thoughts to the table. Um, it, it takes time to work this out. And I know at the stakeholders group, it, it, we, we made progress at the time, and we just look forward to um, being a part of making it a great experience for Zoo guests, animal welfare, and park guests, um, not in that order. All three together. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I, would, I would like to just end with saying one thing. Um, Mark mentioned something about uh, D being the most net neutral. Um, we, we didn't really agree with the way that this uh, whole survey was done and the way it was loaded to push the net neutrality towards D. Um, and I would like to remind everybody that we have hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of hand signed documents from people who would kind of live with everything to me or mail them to me saying they would not have voted for Prop 203 had they known that it was going to go into our group space and there's going to be this level of expansion. So we need to remember that because <laughs> there are a lot of people. Who I said to begin yeah, with, I only speaking for now, Marco. But I was, I said I was speaking for myself. And Steve would agree with you on net neutrality, by the way. Just, just well, to be aware of our Zoom users, quick check in with Star and Marco before we wrap up. I think we've got right, you guys. All right. Bye. Bye. Okay, bye, bye. Bye. Good meeting. Thank you. Thanks, Star. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Okay. Good to wrap. Oh.